Hi all, I'm ahead of the curve, back with another conversation. This time I'm with Nick De Niro. What a pleasure. Um, we, you guys might know Nick from uh, featuring, is it, is it twice now or is it, is it, is it once? I yeah. it's... I've been drawn into the bastard's lair a, a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been a pleasure to have you. Like, every single time, it's funny because every single time like we have you on the, the Bastards podcast, the comment section is just rife with people wanting you back on. I must say the last one that we did was, you know, I liked how we covered so many different topics um, and, you know, went went into the demented demons layer, um, so to speak. Um, but today, <laughs> but, but today we have a we have a fairly unique um, subject uh, that, we, that we're going to discuss. And it's a subject I I will only be here like the viewer, just not really grappling probably everything, you know, to, to comprehend. But um, we're, we're going to be talking. Is, is it right to say? I don't know. I mean, you could say it would be simplistic to say music and how it how reality is shrouded around it and how we hear certain sounds and 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 how we pick up on those and, and per perceive them um uh, but I, you know this conversation from what me and nick have talked about it will be more than that um but i'm lost for words since nick is the person with all the technical understanding of the subject um so i'm just going to get you to roughly i don't know introduce the uh, the discussion and, and we, we can go from anywhere that you want, really, man. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, you know, I'll probably be asking you quite a few things as well. <laughs> your thoughts on stuff. See what, see what you think about certain ideas and things. But yeah, so I, as I like to talk about all the time, I'm a failed academic. Um, <laughs> but I, so I did uh, music composition uh, university, but I also mainly studied um, music technology and computer music. And I specialized my PhD in a subject called electroacoustic composition, which is pretty weird stuff. So I sent you a few links to it, and I think yeah, you were like, it, it was <laughs> it was some out there stuff. I, you know, I was listening, like listening to this with headphones, and I was like, is this going to be some like dodgy site that you're linking me to? Or I mean, and uh, yeah, it was just it was just this um, the, the, the sound was just I don't know. It felt it it felt like it was it wasn't composed it felt like it was this natural these natural sounds but like w without without editing I, I guess I don't know it just it felt very strange and not yeah yeah and so that's so the strange feeling that you mentioned is interesting with that mm. okay so maybe we should talk about those weird things later on with like what's happening in your head and stuff yeah um yeah, so I specialised in electroacoustic music, which is a kind of strange, strange form of composition. So when you like hear it, because what was the name of the chap you had on before he was chatting about music stuff? Yeah, Mar Mauricio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mauricio, okay. <laughs> so he's very smart and he knew loads about sort of like more about music than I do. So loads more. So like about the structure and the content of like things like, you know, what you consider to be classical music where you have like concerts with loads of instruments or maybe he knows loads about songs as well. So like complex sort of harmonic stuff. Uh, and he talked a bit about um, like variations on themes and stuff like that. So getting sort of like one musical idea and then changing that. So you have like loads of variations. So the brain kind of knows that it's it's on a kind of uh, it's on a kind of roll so you so you feel like an anticipation but you're not surprised but you're also never know fully what to expect so like sort of classical music kind of flows along in, in that kind of way so you're never fully shocked like if the note came in or there was suddenly silence or a totally different chord structure came in you'd be like what the fuck is going on? You'd be completely shocked, right? So electroacoustic music is similarly structured, okay, but with noise elements, right? So rather than sort of using like, uh, how can I put it? Um, sort of like classical instruments or guitars or anything like that, 
using kind of noise stuff. And so uh, that can be kind of anything. So I could get, uh, say this glass, right? I could go, just spill that on myself like a few. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been so worse. That, it could have been worse. <laughs> so this, yeah. this tapping sound of this glass, that contains like noise elements because it's got like the sort of like the tap of my finger in it. But there's also a bit of tone, right? There's also a bit of pitch in it. Bing, 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 bing. Okay. So from that, just that item, you have like two things. You've got a noise and a tonal component. And you can, if you, if I sat and recorded that, I could then sort of time stretch it, which means you put, use an algorithm to make the sound longer. So it'd be like, bing. but it would contain all those noise and tonal com components of the material, right? So you end up with these kind of, with people recording all kinds of stuff uh, to try and create different types of atmospheres but they create compositions sort of moving forwards through time that um, kind of extrapolate and use all these different sort of tonal and noise qualities. And you end up after a while of listening to this kind of stuff, beginning to understand and beginning to feel the kinds of sensations and what to expect in the same way that people who compose classical music or other music appreciate that you don't get the same phenomenon right so you're probably used to sort of like you know hearing classical music or great songs and like wanting to like bounce your head around or like classical music you might get those weird chills you know when when like a lot of people don't get it but loads of people do Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> I get I get goosebumps <laughs> if I'm if I'm listening to uh, um, you know, the favorite song at the moment that I that I might that I might have, and and it would feel like this. You know, it, like like I was saying with the with the episode before with um, Mauricio, like kind of this from because of the the death god, man is seeking meaning in anywhere it can get, and it's funny because music has always spoken to us on a, on a, you know, deeper level, but I, I think the more secular we become, the more urgency there is for art and for the ability to have those goosebumps because we're not, we're not getting it from, you know, a church anymore. We're not getting it in a mosque. Um, we're not getting it from, you know, a, a priest telling us and consoling us. Um, so we have to find it from, from other, um, other places. Um, yeah. I, I get, I get. The it's, it's interesting that. though that, yeah, it's interesting that though, isn't it? Because in those circumstances, say a church or uh, you just go back into any religion, right? And you, those two things are linked. But is you know, is it the chicken or the egg? Like, did the music <laughs> make the goosebumps, or did the church make the goosebumps? And then the mute, like it's like those two things. How are they linked? Like, I, my suspicion is religion exploits. The musical sensation, the, the the feelings you get from that, and kind of coerces it into mm. the thing. I mean, like the feelings of like holiness and stuff that I've got to say aren't familiar to me, <laughs> <laughs> but other yeah. people might yeah. might have. Like that might add add to that kind of thing. But for me, it's it's a it's a no brainer. I think you know, put like an amazing track on or whatever. I mean, they do it in advertising, don't they? Just put like cracking tunes on and show you a car, and you're like, "Oh wow!" Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's that need to Ford Focus. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's a you know it's equivalent to um, even even like a well-known actor just being uh, plunged into a in into an advert or or like a tele you know a famous television presenter like um, I don't know Philip Schofield from from uh, England like literally he's in so many he's in so many like random adverts and it's like hello Philip Schofield here like you know I must admit like it caught my attention right it caught yeah. my attention and and it works and that's what that's what that's what you're saying it's like that there is this level of level of exploitation but at the same time you know how receptive our biology is to um 
to, to these kind of things is, is, is very high. And so once we understand human psychology, which we have to some extent at this point, well, I'd hope so. Um, now, you know, for example, business is much psychology. They're, they're, they're sometimes identical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very strange, it's a very strange thing that goes on. But so sort of back to the electroacoustic side of things. I'm only talking about this because why I did. I, I'm not actually that. I'm like, so basically after my PhD, I never really did it yet. So it's just like, I just can't fit. Like many people who do PhDs do this because it's just like you do something for four years and yeah. then you just like, I never want to see it again. Yeah. Um, but So that kind of thing. So... What they, what, so my studies, what they relied on was uh, kind of what a field called psychoacoustic. So I didn't, I wouldn't say rely on, but that was part of the research. And so because I was interested in literature uh, and also society and how things work, but mainly I was interested in technology uh, from teaching psychoacoustics and reading about it there became a very sort of like apparent, very sort of interesting uh, field of research about sort of natural uh, soundscapes, um, which is just like, you know, you go to a field, a jungle, uh, seaside, anywhere, uh, that's kind of not really being interfered with by human technology. It has a very specific sort of evolutionary soundscape. And the reason it's evolutionary is that uh, sort of like your average sort of forest recording contains sort of like basically sort of white noise type elements from say wind sound and rustling of leaves and things like that. But it also contains loads of tonal components produced by different animals. So you have different birds squeaking, like insects are really noisy. So they make loads of different noises. You've got like I don't know, like if you live near me, you've got baboons and crocodiles and shit. Crocodiles. <laughs> in in <laughs> Sheffield's, Sheffield's parks, roaring at people. There's lizards and maybe not all those things, but there's all these different creatures. And what they discovered, what they've sort of managed to sort of figure out was that in order to hear each other really specifically, Creatures evolve to occupy in sort of the sound spectrum, what they call a spectral niche, which is like a very small kind of area of the spectrum. So they, they kind of rarely overlap animals in their, in their natural environment as to the space they occupy. So you get a kind of really balanced sort of open soundscape. So if you imagine, um, because you're normally out in the open, there's not many reflections of sound hitting you in the ears as well. So you get, it doesn't feel closed. It feels very open and you have all these sort of wind elements. And if you imagine just closing your eyes in that environment, you can kind of feel it because all the psychoacoustic cues are telling your brain that it's, it's open and that it's probably safe. I mean, I mean, like loud animals tend to be dangerous because it just in um, in terms of like creating sound, the lower the sound and the louder the sound is harder to make. So it's it's very difficult for people to produce loud sounds or animals to produce loud sounds. It's a good story about this, actually, that Cody might like. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yes, yeah, so, so my research was the opposite of this natural soundscape. So I was focusing on machinery, closed environments. I would get um, hard drives out of computers and I'd strap and put... Uh, what we call PZM mics, so like microphones attached to the mechanical components. Use those to record the insides of machines, uh, the insides of clocks. Um, I was doing all kinds of stuff like that to try and get these claustrophobic, um, horrible kind of sort of industrial. I went and recorded some giant steam engines, um, all kinds of things in order to try and 
harness the opposite of this natural soundscape. So something that was going to basically make people feel very uncomfortable um, was my theory that these things are not, uh, how can I put it, are not particularly pleasant to li listen to, um, but using those to kind of create these, these long sort of electroacoustic sort of uh, spiraling compositions. Like some of them are like 20 minutes long, half an hour long. I think one of them's 40 minutes long. So like proper orchestral length things. Um, and they're like really, really difficult to produce. Like just as an example, like my first composition I took to my supervisor and there was like, it was a minute and a half long. Uh, and he made me do that minute and a half, like, 11 times so that was like months of work of just like needling around and the annoying part was was that at the end of that I accidentally played the guy the first version of it and he said oh that's really good it's like you motherfucker wow <laughs> I, I literally spent a month doing this and his excuse was oh. our wealth uh, that's you know this is how composition works sometimes just like you bullshit it. He's yeah I can tell why you have a drink with you because re recounting that story must must earn it slightly yeah seriously dude yeah I mean you've heard me ranting about academia before but like it's it's pretty messy specialized so from what you're doing this it's quite rigorous right which in some ways is pain in the ass you say limited you were saying mm. before like you structure something wrong and they're like getting pissy about it but the other side yeah. is it's all so subjective and flaky that you just at the total whims of people who, you know, just like on a bad day, they just fail you. Yeah, um, on a friend, well, a friend of mine, for example, has kind of mastered um, the, the essay writing for his particular subject, which is geography. And I think it's um, more specifically, it's, it's political geography. Um, and he found that, basically he got he he got more marks when he was superficially leaning towards one side in his work whereas if it was leaning towards another side um they wouldn't like it so and and the mark would be lower so so he basically just says what exactly what they want to hear which, which is which is fundamentally what you know when it when it comes to these kind of writings because you know unless it's like physics or something um same with psychology like um, as much as it would like to be an empirical science, it isn't. It's 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 a science that changes over time, um, because the mind changes over time depending on culture, as we know. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I have the same problem because it, it's all about, you know, not only structure. I mean, there's so many things here, but like, not only structure, but you, the points that you make, like, it, because they would say, oh, well, this isn't necessarily reminiscent of the most accurate interpretations of the meat of, of the of the current research and then it's like well what do you define as accurate representation because you know it depends on how you interpret the work and also um the 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 conclusions as well so like you said with the structure like you know i had one lecture well i mean i was around you know my classmates and everything and they and they were just really annoyed because we have like let's say three different people who teach in the same kind of module but they just do the little you know the sub subjects within those and you know each of them would basically like say to or recommend is a better word one structure another one would do one structure and another and it's like well don't pretend that like structure doesn't give you a better mark because it clearly does um, and, and, and when something like that is so subjective, when your literal degree is depending on it, I'm not appreciative of such flippancy. Let's just yeah, say that. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. It's 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 so difficult. Like the, with, luckily, so my PhD was marked on sort of. It was like a hundred percent the composition and like the write up that I sent you. That was like basically supplementary. Um, but the composition is graded really heavily technically in terms of like how well it's produced. And so um, that gives you a lot of kind of, you know, if it sounds shit, you, you, you're doomed. And it's a surprising amount of people I got to that stage and really weren't very good at music production at all. 
Um, and so they, they really did struggle. I mean, that was another sort of flaw in the academic system, really, just people getting to like high level degrees who I have no idea how they were getting there because they just had no, no actual practical technical skill at all. Um, probably money based basically you know my <laughs> thoughts about that as well um so yeah it's a very it's a very difficult sort of situation the arts and academia i mean it's, it's got its values and it's really good but at the same time it, in, it, in terms of like judging how how good a piece of work is it's like well i'm sure like loads of like your favorite um authors would have just like been failed yeah. yeah or yeah told they were shit um yeah. you know and it just doesn't it just doesn't bear thinking about it really so so yeah so my experience of it was i would say not great i mean it put me off the whole system but at the same time the things i was producing were interesting um and this idea of psychoacoustics really does work i mean you hear uh obviously like like things like sound design films tv uh computer games don't know if you play computer games but that's like do, yeah. really where loads of really interesting yeah so so the the sort of skills involved in that are insane in video games i don't know how the guys are so good the people producing it is astonishing i i think um, the, the red dead redemption if, one uh i i, I specifically i mean both Red Dead Redemption games are brilliant for their soundtracks, but I think Red Dead One is good in terms of strict acoustics. Like when, when like when you're in the open world, you know, the the, the sound is just so ambient, uh, and and just it really takes you there, you know, to the Wild West, um, you know, outlaws and so on. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's underrated. I mean, you know. We, the thing is, right, is it's the same with films in the same sense that, you know, like actors are the ones who are interviewed, not the directors most of the time. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah. As, as, as much as an actor should get the credit that they deserve, why are the composers, why are, you know, like somewhat, the, thing, the difficult thing is, is that at the end of the day, it would just require you interviewing the entire, you know, crew, the whole production and, Whilst I don't think it's realistic, I think we should give more credit to those who are behind the scenes who actually are part of that cumulative journey of making it, um, well, part of the pun, a sound project. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and sound engineers are like notoriously like, really poorly paid uh, in comparison to other elements, you know, on like a film set or something they don't get great money. I think composers do a little bit better, but, um, you know, you, we're entering a kind of weird era where the, the sound design and the, and the music are kind of merging into the same, into the same thing. I mean that, you know, have you seen the new Dune film? I have, all? Yeah. 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 So things like that, like the sound design in that and the, and the score are just basically like part of the same thing. They're not really separable. Um, and that's, that seems to be how things are going. Uh, and, it's, and it's just because, you know, the, the environmental sound creates such a vivid kind of felt human experience that we really rarely speak about. Um, so that's sort of why I was investigating doing my PhD. Um, in some ways, in a very artsy way, there was no studying as, you know, there's no formal research, um, but you definitely know, you know, just like some things sound claustrophobic and some don't, you know, some things sound open and closed. There's no way of getting around it because of the way reverb works in a room, your brain just fully understands space um, and from your hearing is probably better than your eyesight. Um, you know, people who are blind can sort of find their way around fairly well um, because they recognize the acoustic environment that they're in. Um, you know, obviously, like if something's directly in front of you or whatever, you might not know it, but the, the space around you, it's, 
you know, that is determined by your hearing. You know, it's a mix of your visual and audio senses kind of blending into one thing. Um, but even that is kind of a bit jarring. I mean, there's loads of sort of psychoacoustic tests that, that they've sort of done with experiments where there is a kind of, there's like a, I think there's like a hard point where you can, if you are bouncing a ball, say, and you've got video and the audio of bouncing a ball, you break, you can change the, uh, the timing between the two elements. So the visual and the audio. So say the, the, the ball is gradually drifting out of time. Uh, the brain syncs all that up together until it hits a hard point. I can't remember the exact timing, but then it will desynchronize. So it's kind of similar to how you know your nerves work in your body. Like you know full well that if you pinch your finger and you pinch your toe, there's like way more nerves and distance going to your brain from your toe and from your finger but you feel it all at the same time because your brain is constantly trying to map things together to make a coherent picture of the world um you know so it, it's kind of artificially sort of molding these senses together um kind of forgotten what i was talking about but it, it's it's all this kind of stuff yeah look, yeah well I don't know if it would draw your memory, but yeah, we we were on the subject of I guess Dune and uh, when oh, yeah, you, of course when when you um, said about Dune and films, I was you know I, I was thinking the Dark Knight, just Joker's themes, just the the what is it like the piano wire or something? It's it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Just I remember being in year seven, right? So I was about eleven. And my music teacher, one of the first things that he put on for us was a Dark Knight soundtrack, Joker's Joker's soundtrack with the piano wire and like insane work for it by Hans Zimmer. And I, I wasn't even like I liked the Dark Knight. I got into the Dark Knight a couple of years after that. So at the time I was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But, you know, whatever. But now I'm just like if I I, I listened to a um, it sound a bit silly, but but I because I watched the Batman film recently. Um, I, I I saw a YouTube video of like one scene from the film where um, where Batman's kind of like grappling up um, or rappling up the uh, the staircase, and and it was kind of a compilation between all the different Batman soundtracks. And as soon as the Dark Knight one came on, it was just it was something else. Like the other ones are good, but there's just something there that is just so phenomenal by Zimmer that it, it's under it, it's just it's just so special um it's yeah I mean and uh, you know with Interstellar and things like that what do you what do you think of what do you think of those films if you've, if you've yeah they're them? bloody brilliant so yeah especially yeah Zimmer is an absolute beast like his stuff is really really good um it's interesting, actually. So Batman is a cracking example of just um, of this sort of merge, this this creation of an aud audio atmosphere. OK, so it's raining all the time, right? In most in half of these Batman films, it's pissing down. And that in itself is creating this this full layer of everything uh, of this. This well, you know, it, it's without that sonic element, it would feel completely different. Uh, obviously there's a visual too, right? We know it's raining, but the sound in itself really tells you something about what's going on. It's got a real feeling to it. The brain knows, you know, it's wet, it's probably cold. It's, it has all these elements that really sort of like, just build an atmosphere and that with the score combined, it's it's just so atmospheric, and you're right that Zimmer's work is particularly outstanding. I don't know why. I, there's no, I couldn't put a formula on it. I couldn't explain to you what the what the magic was. Uh, he's just fucking brilliant, basically. Um, but it's so it's interesting, right? So Batman, <laughs> Batman is a great example of one sort of because I think I like sent you a few examples, or maybe just a just an article about sort of like some of the psychoacoustic yeah. uh, kind of flaws that we have. So 
just like you know how we see faces in things all the time jesus in a in a in a a bit of toast yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. jesus in a toast like god in a cloud like (laughs) we're practically and that that you know relevant to our discussion not only visually but also through through the auditory um senses as well yeah 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 so so absolutely so so like the human brain so so one auditory sort of it's uh, sort of psychoacoustic kind of uh, sort of artifact is that decoupling of sound with the visual where the brain will just just jar the two together for as long as it can until it becomes untenable and then all of a sudden it just goes no they're not the same thing um, there are other things right okay so there's a phenomenon called shepherd tones which they use in batman right so shepherd tones is a way of making the brain feel like a tone is constantly going up or constantly going down, right? So uh, all I would say is people just need to Google it and listen to it because you feel like going fucking insane. <laughs> it is basically just like a, what what the brain does is it's it just as a pitch goes too high or then cycle back to the lower one. And so it sounds like a kind of, sort of tonal corkscrew in your brain just like but it just doesn't stop like i can't explain it i I think i I don't know what piece it is but i i think that you know that kind of concept in the piece that i listened to with the the video on youtube i think it was i think it was a piece which used that because it was like this building like i yeah yeah, the, the dark knight I don't know about Batman Begins. The Dark Knight Rises, I think, uses that as well. But it, but, but there is this sense with Zimmer's work in The Dark Knight specifically, which is it, which is a build, and that's the thing. Like the film itself is is based on a build. It's Harvey Dent. It's it's him being yeah, yeah. and you know, it, and, and it's used. It, it's used not only in that sense, but also um, in scenes, obviously, where uh, there's there's some sort of climax, dramatic climax, and and it's just it's just brilliant just brilliant yeah and so well so specifically this this effect is used by the sound designers not in the score or anything like that but in order to create tension it's built into his motorbike so what they've done is they've built this shepherd tone kind of scrolling thing which makes it sound like it's constantly accelerating because it's this constant kind of feeling of the pitch rising but it's also staying the same. So it's like this feeling of like constant pushing forward, but also kind of drag as well. It's like it, the, your, your audience just needs to listen to shepherd tones and they'll know what I mean. It is absolutely bonkers. And I think you can Google it. I think there's some sound designers uh, article or something explaining how they did it. Uh, someone at uni, um, not uni, someone in a recording studio told me about it and looked it up and I was like, that is clever because it's not, um, it's just a real good exploitation of the hu- sort of flawed human system for hearing because it's not, it's not great. Like, so our hearing is okay, but it's, well, you know, I talked before, didn't I, about how I think it's only in your head. And so, and, and things like that kind of demonstrate it. You know, if, if we heard what was happening that we can see with, you know, like, um, you know, digital recording system, you could see kind of this thing like rising, but the brain kind of thinks it's falling and it's spiraling. Um, so that that is like you know that's that's one way of sort of really tricking you and using that trick within you know a really practical sort of thing like a, a movie a motorbike accelerating to to you know create a sense of unease and hmm. exploit the listener you know <laughs> I, I like how you're using the word exploit because whilst it's a strong word it's to to captivate anybody's psychological attention in a technical level you do need to exploit that attention um 
and there's there's no escape from that um because because what these adver- you know, advertisements do i guess to round it up in some way to the <laughs> to the 10 minutes ago but um but uh yeah it's, it's all about it's all about grabbing the attention i, I want to focus on there's a lot there right but i want to focus on the whole it's it's all in our head can you expand uh-huh. on that yeah i can so so this is my idea of it i'm probably wrong it's probably like brilliant neuroscientists out there and shit who know i'm wrong okay but what what we do know so this is this is so i taught digital theory right so so this is a theory of how we capture sound sound in the air the movement of the airwaves into one of these microphones right so we use a mic to capture that sound and then that is a system of sensing uh, with a sort of charged mesh the um the movement through the air in a really accurate way uh, and then that will then go through wire into your machine and then in your machine that is captured through uh digital to analog converter it's the other way around an analog to digital converter that's when you play it back okay so uh, an analog to digital converter and what that does is that takes the voltage f- produced so it's the difference in the movement of the mic is turned into voltage, which is then captured by a sound card, you know, a, a converter. And what a converter does is it uses two functions, right? So you see waveforms, you know, when you're editing your audio, you've got a waveform and it's like yeah. a long line, yeah. okay? Yeah. So you know the, the wave is going up and down along a horizontal mm. axis basically okay so this wave is going up and down and the computer what the computer is doing is is it's capturing dot points right to a certain resolution um so with uh cd quality okay it's making a single dot point 44.1 thousand times a second right so um so it's making these dot points and it's charting that voltage on a graph. Uh, so they look like dots and then it's drawing a line between them. It's extrapolating a line between all these dots, which is the line you see on the waveform, right? On your audio editor when you're doing your video. So my theory about the sound, okay, is the sound in your head that you've heard is no more real than the sound on your hard drive, the, the information pattern on your hard drive that is that dot pattern, that uh, pulse code modulation data on your hard drive. They're kind of the same thing, right? So your brain is doing a similar thing. It is sensing these movements in the air and converting them into a completely different format in order to give you information about the world around you. There is no way it can be any other way. Um, it, it amazes me that we've, that we've managed to actually do that, to replicate how it, how it worked on our head and then onto a machine. I mean, that feels insane to me. Yeah, it is, but it's, it's never quite the same, right? So it's, it's kind of there, but it's not quite the same. Um, you know, you, you know full well, right, that if you're, if, I don't know if you've ever done sort of live interviews with people, but I did quite a lot of like recording of, uh, you know, conversations outside. Uh, it's when you're on a film shoot, you record people. And even the tricks of the brain are a nightmare there, right, because... Your brain is constantly filtering out, especially for language, right? So you, fo- so the brain focuses on language really strongly, to the point where you drown out noise in the moment really well, and then it's quite frequent to do recordings of conversation or some objects that you really, really want to record uh, in isolation, and then you get the recording home and you're like, "Fuck! All I can hear is the other stuff." 
Mm. Because in the moment, your brain is isolating things. And when you get home, you realize that it's it's not doing that. <laughs> the recording is a lot worse than you thought it was because it's picked up all these other elements that you just weren't hearing. Um, noise, your brain is amazing at tuning out noise. Like if you have a white noise signal at the same volume as a conversation, the, the brain will tune out the noise amazingly well, even though it's it like even louder. Like if you're on a plane and you're talking to someone, you can hear them, but the, the background noise is insanely loud. Is it, well, it's, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when you're at a concert or something or some, somewhere where the, the sound is extremely loud. And then when you're actually there, it, you know, at first it's loud, but, but then, but, but then it blend like it blends in with, everything blends in and then you can hear the other person that you're talking to for example like if you're at a nightclub i think my uh i don't know if you can hear but my computer's over <laughs> over fanning at the moment i don't know if that's audible <laughs> right okay um, now well the the noise thing will be getting rid of it the noise algorithm in your software <laughs> well there there we go there yeah. we go um and and like you said we, we cancel out the 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 music um when we're you know, talking to somebody at a nightclub, but the but obviously we still have to shout and we still have we, we you know they have to be extremely close to our ear because of because the disruption is just so large, and so, and so it you know that's why more focus has to be on the receiving end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, evolutionarily, we've got to be able to hear each other talk, otherwise we're just screwed. But but I mean, things like nightclubs, the like or like be going to like like the the loudness is insane like for it for you to have to shout in someone's ear that's not good it's not good yeah no i i i, I can sometimes physically feel my eardrum just just slightly like you know tingling when yeah. when i'm in those kind of situations when it's so loud and somebody's having to shout in my ear it's just like yeah shit yeah. yeah, but so there's been certain times in my life when I've been in those kinds of situations and I've known that's it, like my hearing's never going to be the same again. <laughs> and, it, and it genuinely does happen. You know, when you walk out of a nightclub and you hear that high pitched tinnitus ringing yeah. in your ears, like, yeah. Bee! Yeah. that's not good. Well, that is, that's a bad sign. It's, yeah, I mean, it's interesting we're talking about this particular subject within sound because. Uh, I, I've been playing a game, Cyberpunk 2077, and it was on sale. I was like, let's just check it out as a futuristic. I did exactly game. the same thing. Really? I did exactly. Yeah, I got it like a month ago or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was um, on sale and I was like, yeah, okay, I'm doing it. Yeah, because because they did the patch and they fixed like loads of stuff. I don't know what platform mm -hmm. you have, but I have an Xbox and like and on console it was like unplayable for like a year, but then they fixed it. And I was like, okay, yeah, let, let's just get into it. As a side note, I think it's absolutely amazing. I, I love that game. Um, they fixed it so well. Um, there's going to be DLC as well in the future, I think. Um, but but anyway, what was... I, I, I noticed that the audio was louder. The bass audio was louder um, of that game. And because I didn't really think about it, you know, I was just playing the game. Whereas in the other game that I played, the bass audio is actually lower. So when I was playing Cyberpunk, um, that required my ear. It was far louder for my ears, basically. And because I played it instead of the other one so much, um, let's say, you know, three out, a couple of hours a day, whatever, whatever um, because I was playing that consistently and because it was such a loud noise and I didn't, I didn't realize at the time that it was as loud as it actually was, um, I, I went... I went half deaf. Like I don't know why it was half. Don't ask me. But like I, I went like, like in one ear. I just it was really blocked. Um, and 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 it yeah. It, it, there was no there was no pain or anything. It was just, and it wasn't even it wasn't that loud. Like it wasn't that loud, but it was just louder than the other thing that I was playing. So you know, like gunshots. Were you wearing headphones or? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, wear, yeah. I wear headphones. Um. I, it's kind of a mystery why it was one ear because I was thinking, well, maybe it's not the game because it's one ear. But then, but then I read up that maybe, you know, that it does happen anyway. Um, or one ear can be more susceptible to sound than the other, which I think is true. Yeah. Um, which I, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that's the case for me um, from other experiences. But getting back to the point, which was 
yeah, I, I went because of the sound difference. And I didn't, I didn't interpret that sound being profound enough at the time. It was only after that I, that I felt the effects from it. Um, and in terms, I mean, I, I don't know how much you, you looked into, researched um, about ORIs and, and how they work, how they receive um, audio, but, but are we in a sense permanently damaged as such whenever that happens? It, what, do, you, do you know what the... Do you know yeah, what the, yeah you know what so I'm for? not... Yeah, I'm not an audiologist, so I don't really know, but I think, I think well, yeah, the like permanent damage is like, absolutely inevitable. Uh, it doesn't really take, so you think like we um, spent like quarter, of, well, like what the vast majority of human history only with natural sounds, they're not that loud. You know, like you go outside, you, you know, uh, hearing must be like being constantly damaged. Just, just think about like a car, how loud a car going past is mm. in comparison to like being in the woods or something. Um, you know, we didn't really make that much. I mean, I guess like l large gatherings of people and stuff would make a bit of noise but i think yeah. our ears are pretty like fragile when it comes to noise interesting story i think the um i think the sort of uh shit what's the term for it now the dynamic range right so the difference between the quietest and the loudest sound uh is really crucial so so it's kind of similar to what you're saying so there's an interesting thing about um inuit populations going deaf okay so they um because you know snow is a really good absorber of sound i don't know if you've ever noticed that when it snows it feels really quiet like so a lot of people say this but i've noticed it it might not be on other people's minds but it definitely snow makes things now that you quiet. say that yeah now that you say it, i mean that that might con contribute to why it might feel more peaceful as well when when it's snowing when you're yeah, out yeah, 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 yeah. It's absorbing all the ambient noise. But so, if you imagine, I'm guessing. I think I don't even know where I heard this. I might just be making it up. But they, um, in sort of Inuit populations, they had really low background sounds. So they have incredibly sensitive hearing. But what they got hold of were guns, at some point, and so the guns were like incredibly loud, and they're only for a short obviously a gunshot but the gunshots were really damaging the hearing profoundly because they're so used to such a quiet environment the dynamic range is just too much for their ears i mean guns are insanely loud um and so yeah i mean from my time in the uh hills when those hicks were shooting all those crows and things like you can hear them from fucking miles away like guns are loud and so you know there is definitely you know like loud sounds i i think even our current machinic environments are really damaging our ears my hearing is wrecked i mean i'm 43 uh, and i've done a lot of stuff in recording studios and things but my hearing is you know not what it used to be uh but it it tailors off with age, have you, have you heard, have you ever heard about these, um, they like, so with this topic of psychoacoustics, human hearing degrades as you get older. So your he hearing's probably up to something like, what are you, 20, 23 or 22 or something? 22 in June. Okay, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, you're, so you can probably hear something like, he, the top of human hearing is 20 kilohertz. Um, and I think like as you as you sort of enter your twenties, it's sort of down to like 18, 19 kilohertz. Mine's probably at about 16, maybe 15. Uh, I haven't tried, I could try, I haven't tested. I don't, to be honest, I don't like doing it because I don't want to know how much it's yeah, you want to sleep at night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um so that so it does degrade, but there's these 
funny uh, machines they've built, right, to stop like teenagers hanging out in certain spots and they produce these really high frequency, like really annoying noises, but you can't hear them because well, I wouldn't be able to hear them because they're too high up. So like my hearing will have dropped off by then. But it, I mean, it's always true because they're like really loud. They're really annoying. But like, what if you, <laughs> what if you're like a mum and you're taking your baby in? <laughs> to the shop or whatever it is and like there's things like that surely just be real i can't really surely that's not ethical i don't know yeah that's I'm, I'm, I'm wondering ethical. that like like yeah i mean that would have to be some really really pissed off authority or some neighbor who just bought this piece of machinery um yeah it's yeah. like a proper security system i was tempted to google it then but i'm not going to do it I hope it's not something else I've just made up. I swear it was a thing like yeah. using like these high frequency sort of irritants to get rid of teenagers. I know they do it to cats. So like a lot of people don't like cats. I've got two. I'm a fan of cats, but pretty cats much everyone cool. else I know. Yeah. yeah, well, everyone I know hates them. It's a bugbear. <laughs> but, but anyway, but you can, the people put these high frequency emitters in their gardens that no humans can hear, but cats drives them mad I, i've never heard of that ah, that's really oh that's yeah really yeah interesting that's really well, this is a cat repellent is, and <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah. this is this is part of my thing right if we can't hear it it's part of the audio spectrum then what are we hearing what we're hearing isn't the real thing it's just a, a snippet and even that we're turning into things it's not well can you hear a does a tree that falls in a forest make any sound, Nick? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It moves the air about. Only people make sound in their heads. No sound anywhere else. I mean, you could put a microphone there mm. and record a voltage, and then that could go into a machine, turn it into a dot matrix, and then draw a line through it. And then when you play it back, you hear a sound, but that's still in your head. There's no, there's no, it's not, it's so, the uh, sound. So, so what are the implications? I mean, what are the implications of the, the current state of, of, you know, how loud things are in the modern world? Um, have, have you researched anything to do with like the future and how our, our hearing will be affected by the fact that sounds are maybe getting louder but maybe you disagree because you know we have we have e-cars now barely make any sound yeah, yeah. unless you turn on a button and show how cool you are in front of everybody yeah you're manufacturing yeah, well, sound yeah 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 a, fr a friend of mine's got one of one of these he picked me up the other day and he was like <laughs> saying, oh my look at this he's like it's such a pain in the ass because everyone just keeps walking out he said people look with their ears which they do yeah yeah um, yeah i think the sonic environment is going to improve frankly. I'm very much hoping it will. I'm not sure what it's like now compared to like 60 years ago, 100 years ago. Like, I think the Industrial Revolution, it probably fucking sucked. Uh, like, can you imagine like working in one of these steel mills or something like that? Yeah. Like, or, or, like, that would not be good. Steam and trains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think a lot of it is I think it's on on the up, you know, we have like regulations about noise and stuff now because it's such a pain in the ass. Um, so I think it will improve, but I think it is damaging our hearing all the time. I think things like, um, you know, headphones. So it, it's an interesting phenomenon, right? Because what you were saying about the, the bass level in cyberpunk, right? Mm. You can't, so bass is an interesting thing because if you don't hear it, uh, if you do, like it, it gives sound a certain amount of power, right? So if you have really shit headphones and they're really tinny, people quite often turn them up really loud to try and get that same feeling of impact. Um, and that is just going to really fuck up your hearing in the upper ranges because you're kind of making up for this loss. Mm. other thing like advice is like if you listen to headphones a lot buy the best ones you can afford because you're going to be trying to make up for the shit sound quality um by turning it up it, ha it happens all the time like ones that properly seal like if they're not properly sealed to your ears 
outside noise is going to get in. You're going to be turning them up. It's not, it's, I mean, like, I'm not, it's not my job. I don't know anything about this, really, but I know. Full it's all well making sense that. to me. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, for example, a friend of mine, because um, my, my Xbox ones, you know, I, I'm not, I don't really like to patch in um, to, you know, the best things. Like, you know, I've got a normal controller. I don't buy any of that stuff, modded stuff. I'm not really interested in that. But now, but now that you now that you say it though, um, I think I should probably go for a better uh, headset because my friend he's bought a new one and he the, the headset is literally um, the ones that enclose upon your ears and and yeah, yeah. And, and they they are the proper ones whereas mine um, is more open and it's it's it was about thirty quid or something. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know what you you know about that thing you said there, which is. The low, like the lower the quality of um, uh, you know headphone or, or earphone whatever actually does something to your hearing because of the the external things that are trying to make up for it being a bad quality um, a headset or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think I think it's more just a, a human response that if you don't if you can't really hear something you just turn it up, mm. which, which is like the the. The best way to hear something is to turn the background down, right, and and try and keep the thing as isolated as as possible and sounding as good as possible. Mm. I mean, so okay, so this is another interesting sort of psychoacoustic um, thing that is used in order to improve the quality of sounds, uh, which is something called the uh, the missing fundamental. This is a uh, kind of way the brain sort of invents something or or uh, sort of creates something that isn't there, right? So, so it's t- tones are structured in various different ways. So you can have like a pure tone, and if you just play a pure tone, it sounds really boring and dry, like a bah. and the harmonics and the noise factors around a tone are what make them sound different. So if I played uh, a note on my guitar uh, and that same note on a piano, right? They're the same frequency. So, you know, one's A at 440 hertz on a piano and one's A on a, on a guitar. So what makes them different? What makes them different is, is the harmonic and the noise components of them. The, it's like a really complex structure, okay? Uh, and so what the, what the brain sort of does which is really interesting is if you use the partial harmonic tones if you create the say like it's really funny it's like i'm so used to talking about this stuff with like a presentation or like a diagram (laughs) i'm like constantly like reaching around trying to show you because it's really hard to talk about without any visual yeah yeah (laughs) but so basically like if you imagine like uh, you have a tone at the bottom and then that is kind of has got like multiples of it or partial tones above it uh, that kind of fill in the this kind of structure of the tone. Um, the, the strange thing is, is that if you just play the partial harmonics of it, the brain will just make up the fundamental bottom one. So you will hear a low sound, even though it isn't there. Um, and so there's there's some really interesting tech with this um, used in like the radio and stuff. There's a plugin called Waves Max Bass. I'm not using your platform advertising. It don't work for Waves, but um, but so what that does is that uses um, this te- this. this this flaw in the in the human brain to create like extra bass in things where it isn't really there. Uh, it's quite it's it's a very cool sort of tech, but that's kind of just another sort of function of the brain. Like it is constantly like the visual system pulling things together, using all these different elements and to to make a, a coherent picture, which is imaginary it's not imaginary but it's not real it's a simulation it's not a, it's, yeah so, so we're getting all matrix here the red or blue mm. pill <laughs> yeah so but that's you know it's i don't know man it's weird like as soon as you start getting into any of this stuff it's weird um 
I don't know what you think, really. But it's like, oh, yeah, so that is what I was going to ask you about. So did you look at that paper about, um, like, natural acoustic environments sort of making people feel better? What the, the, the article, so you sent a, an article and then there's your PhD. Um, and I also, yeah, I did, so the, yeah. So there was what, I don't know if you will have seen it. So I sent like you like a bunch of stuff, all yeah, of which I've pretty much ignored today. Um, <laughs> but, there, but there was one about sort of like natural sounds against uh, affecting positively people's mental health. And I didn't know if you'd read it. Like it was like I'm about. Sure, I'm sure I went. Woods. Yeah, I looked at it immediately because I, I was just, I was just like, oh, okay. Um, you might. Yeah, can you can you reiterate? Um, what was well, it? To be honest, I just sort of skimmed it. And I just wanted to know what you thought about it because I, I was like, the the people have said this to me my whole academic mm. career, but it's never been a psychologist or anyone who knows anything about it. Well. Well, I do, I do know that there's a book which I was actually recommended by um, a psychologist that I'm working with. And it's, and it's basically a book about how being in nature, like being more attached to nature itself, um, is more consoling for, for the human psychology. Um, I, I haven't checked it out myself, but I would be interested to see if there's any sort of reference to sound. And making any similar points to what to what to what has been said here, um, but but I think there I think there is a correlation to be fair between our connection to nature and our well being being enhanced, whether that be through vi- you know the the visual stimuli or, or the or, you know the, the the trees rustling and the the leaves uh, rustling and and, uh, and other things, it really wouldn't surprise me, and I doubt that. That it would be incorrect to 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 make that um, to posit that that would be that would be true, um, and and the thing is we've we've lost all of that today. I mean, for me personally, I'm not really one to talk about that because you know as much as I love nature, I, I'm one of those kind of utility people. If if I don't have an objective, then I'm not really that motivated to do something. Um, so when I do go out, it's like, oh, I'm going to go out because I'm going to do a book hunt trying to find some charity shop, you know, books, or I'm going to read in public or whatever, you know, I'm just going to chill. And when I have a, when I have a agenda, that's when I like to go out. Um, and so, but, you know, when I do, you know, I went out today very briefly, I just, I, I got my booster COVID jab, basically, and I you know, had a walk around um, where, where it was located and and, and, and yeah i mean it, to me it's just it feels almost self-evident to say that the more exposure we have with nature the more our well-being is enhanced and yeah it doesn't surprise me i, I doubt that it will be refuted in any way to be honest yeah i guess it's a difficult thing to quantify but um mm. because how do you how do you quantify happiness for example i mean it, it's one of those it's one of those really controversial things one of the first things that they brought up in in my psychology course was well how do you quantify happiness how do you quantify well-being and one of the problems with sam harris's um moral landscape book is is he tries to say there is an objective morality in the sense that you can tell um that something is is better because if you do something else in replacement of it you're missing out on something but the thing is in most cases, I, I would say there's an element of truth to that, but I think firstly, it's misunderstanding what objective means, but it's also not really taking seriously the idea that satisfaction is just such a uh, satisfaction, joy, happiness, um, depending on the word that you use, because semantics is so important. Like when I start off writing, you know, a paper, uh, not a paper, like a like an essay um, at, at university, I always begin with defining my fun in my terms um because if you don't do that then, then you're in a mess and the problem that's another problem which is it depends on which word you use in the question that you have if you say like is your well-being enhanced by this particular stimuli you, you know well-being oh that's connected to spirituality so do i feel more spiritual oh yeah happiness do i feel more happy do i feel more joyful you know that that's a separate question to well-being well-being is far more uh, it's far more of a 
um, let's say, an objective, um, a more neutral description than happiness, I would say. So all of this comes down to when you're surveying people, when you have these sort of questionnaires, it's, it's all about the semantics that you use and also obviously the, the stimuli that, that the receiver um, is, is, is having. I don't know if that answered, you know. No, the, it's, you know, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, that, it's one of those things, isn't it? I, well, it's just like, you know, how, you know, it, there's so much subjectivity in all of these things. Mm. Some people might like being miserable, secretly, I don't know. Well, you know, well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because you, you say that and, and it's funny because as much, at, and I wrote an article about this on Medium, um, and it was, it was um, is religion just a coping mechanism? Because one of the, one of the, yeah, I read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe you can tell me what you think. And it's like, well, my conclusion was, is that either way we're all, just being consoled by something like you know you could say the atheist uh, receives less consolation because there's no divine entity to you know no sky daddy to to go towards when you ascend to heaven like jesus um you could say that but a lot of the time these let's say just a typical atheist let's say they find consolation in their atheism in itself and then some some atheists not all but some identify with with their um lack of belief or disbelief in such a way that they find it paradoxically consoling that there's no responsibility well it's not paradoxical i guess because the less responsibility you have cosmically speaking the more free you are but the problem with that is that the more free we are the more insecure we are and so the dilemma is do you want more freedom but but having more responsibility or do you want less freedom um, yeah, and having, yeah. and having uh, because, because at the end of the day, like historically speaking, people have subdued their own solidarity for an authority figure to tell them what to do, how to live. I mean, religious texts do this in their entirety. The yeah, Bible yeah. says which the Old Testament says um, which fabrics you should wear, what position you should sleep with somebody. I mean, it, it, the list goes on. It's 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 prescriptive. Um, yeah, yeah and descriptive and so it, it's it's quite literally the definition of handing over your own solidarity um but but then the religious individual would say well you know it's better than being in cosmic meaninglessness and having no direction maybe that's true but i prefer my own solidarity rather than handing my my soul to um an entity that can't be demonstrated to be benevolent um or ominous and and omnipotent at the same time um so basically on either side i think there are issues there are issues and it, so maybe, maybe i've just sure. overcomplicated the, the the you know the, the yeah, well, it's, it's, thing but it's pro- yeah yeah i yeah. Also, well yeah it's it's a it's a strange thing isn't it right but for me i think well i don't know if people what people's religious journeys are like or their but i think sort of uh, this is totally off piece, okay? It's not my thing. I don't really know. But so I feel that, say, the things that you and, and uh, Gareth and Cody have talked about quite a lot. I've been involved in some of those conversations yeah. um, where, you know, we, we talk about sort of the, the nihilistic uh, thinking and stuff. But the strange thing to me about uh, equating these things as copes Right. So we all, everyone has a cope, you know, some people just obsessed with fucking getting the next to fancy TV, what yeah. have you. Um, yeah. Or money is their the god or, or, or they're interested in cyberpunk cash, is you know, your god. Kind of Where, what? Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, anyway, so a bit for, for me, so for me, the I don't know how much pain, right, a religious journey has in it. Um, but I think it's kind of religion is for many, many people, including me. I, so I was brought up in like religious schools. Uh, and I think we, it's a kind of a priori assumption, this, this, this religious belief in whatever culture you're in, this talk of a God is fucking everywhere. And I think th- the divorce from that idea is extremely painful, pretty much for everyone who has to 
come to accept it, right? So, so, so you you know, we might say like a nihilistic person or someone who is an atheist or something. It's a cope for them, um, but I do feel like a religious cope is different because it gives you some light at the end of the tunnel, right? I I feel like it's a more hopeful uh, idea that that there's there's something more to this um and i think a kind of nihilistic or, or any i want to say nihilism but nihilism is a strange word right because it's the absence of something so that the absence of something is it's nothing right so it's mm. it's a, it's a it's a very strange thing it's not something uh, and there is a difference you know the, uh, an absence of something is different to the presence of something it's, i don't equate them you know i think they're different and i and i think um Many people who have come reach the conclusions. I'm not sure quite where you are, James, but I know the other bastards. <laughs> I don't think there. anyone knows where I am. Um, yeah, yeah, me, yeah. But uh, me, me neither. I, you know, mm. I'm. Um, I, but you know, with I, I think just to just to add because I, I think you were wanting to say something else in conjunction with with the previous. But um, I, I want to also hear what you think of this, which is not only is the hope. A matter of importance here but it's also the conviction the security around a conviction of our belief for example you know um the more convicted you are of a concept whether it be atheism or, or theism the fact that you are encapsulated by this certainty is in itself a cope in some sense because it's the more we label things uh the, the more we label things the, the more certain and um and, and pristine they become as a conception and so we become more comfortable with a, well assuming we understand something just because we put a label under it so so the idea is not only not only is hope an important factor here but it's also how much consolation do our convictions give us and i think regardless of theism or atheism either way there's a conviction there's a security coated around this conviction which is oh well atheism um, is the way to go and therefore I have to build my ethos around that and therefore that is some sort of I mean maybe this is scraping the bottom of the barrel perhaps perhaps but but my point is and this is obviously the point at the end of the article which is either way we're screwed because we are we are a, an animal that is always attempting to create an ethos under which to live and to justify living at uh, Otto Rank the psychoanalyst with the truth one can't live we're always trying to avoid the, the, the brute facts, the brute facts. And whilst atheism, um, I, I guess I guess you could say atheism and atheism somewhat, you know, agree with brute fact in general um, about about physics, let's say. Um, but when you but when you really get down to it, any strong conviction is its own security. Do you do you have anything to add to that? You know, and, and what you were saying earlier. Just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so okay. So the conviction. So yeah. So it's interesting, right? So the conviction. I, I don't really know how to put this. I feel like the conviction of a presence of something and the conviction of an absence of something are different, right? They so this is this. I'm not. I'm not a philosopher. I don't know, but my assumption is yeah. that. The absence of something requires less a burden of proof than the presence of something, right? Because we could then claim anything to be real without any evidence, right? But the absence of something doesn't require evidence, does it? I mm. mean, that's... It depends on what we mean by absence, I suppose. Um, I mean, the, the burden proof idea is, is really... I, I want to say it's not confusing, but I've, I've definitely had developed ideas around it because i've talked to many of my theistic friends and they've said well and i don't know how true this is because i still have to think about it but i think there's something worth thinking about it though which is atheists a lot of the time say i'm not the one with the burden on proof i'm not the one who needs to prove anything but actually i think whatever view we hold shouldn't we have a solid justification for it regardless of having the bird or a burden whatever we want to however we want to conceptualize that basically 
if we are positing a negative or a positive, surely we should be justified in in the in the lack of belief or belief in in whatever we're trying to um, trying to demonstrate or, or not demonstrate. For example, the atheist could say, oh, "I don't have the burden of proof," but at the same time, they're trying to say everything is encapsulated under naturalism, and that in itself is a claim. It's an active claim, and so does that not require a justification in the same regard that a theist would say? Um, I believe my interpretation of, of, of what we know epistemologically is, and, and in other ways, is there, there's, a, there's a creator. So I think, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, I'm still working on it, but I, but I think it's, that either way, that, that, that I, I think either way, we have to be able to justify what we think, regardless of whether somebody's a theist or not. Again, it's not a finished thing in my mind. It, it's, yeah, yeah, I don't know how yeah, that yeah. came out, but. What do you no, think? no, I know what you mean. So, so I, I get what you're saying. Any claim requires evidence, then. Yeah. But, but so, but my thinking is that you require something in order to make that claim in the first place, <laughs> right? What, so, what, what our capacity to, to think, to our yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's that, but there's also okay, so. Say there's, I, I don't really know how to explain what I'm getting at. How does this turn into a religious thing? Anyway, I'm happy with this. <laughs> it does with me. I, I mean, it, it's just, it always does with let's, me. Let's, let's, let's go there. So yeah. you have, right, so the conception of something. Okay, mm. so God, like, let's take a God, any God, okay. okay. That's that's the conception of something, right? So is it that's a thing, okay? So the inverse of the thing is that equally weighted? Like because without any sort of real evidence for something, the the how can I put this? If I wanted to say like, okay, there's like a praying mantis that lives under Southampton and it's got one leg right and this leg yeah. is made of sulfur and it and it spits yeah. out this sulfur and then I you know get sick on Friday sometimes because mm. the sulfur of this thing travels you you can make up anything right mm. and the burden of proof is on you to prove that that's a thing yeah it's not on the the person who doesn't believe it Right, who or it's not that doesn't believe it, but that has no reason. To, oh shit, has no reason to believe it. Okay, and so my my idea about the whole religious thing is just that any claim counterclaim to it is the inverse of a claim. Right, it's not it's not a position in itself. It's not a position. It's it's the response to a claim. So the response to a claim is not the same as the claim to start with. Mm -hmm. that's that's sort of how it feels to me it's like if you suggest yeah. anything yeah then the counterclaim to it is is where like the burden of proof is on you who is making the claim mm. Mm. not the person who's not so so yeah. an atheistic approach is the response to a claim about something because you can claim anything at all but I, it's, I, it's I on, guess... the, on the claimant to produce the evidence for it I, I, I'm I'm with you all the way. I'm with you all the way. And and for the sake of just ex experimenting here, just philosophically, it's like, wouldn't that be assuming that atheism is the a priori position? Is it safe to say that it is? Well, the absence of something is always the a priori position, because a thing is a thing, and the absence of something is nothing. So mm. surely the presence of the thing is the is the counterclaim? I don't know. I'm just. Yeah. It's just how it looks yeah. to me. So the, yeah. so the something something being a priori can't be. I mean, what what is the a priori position to any claim? It is. I don't. I. You know, it's a priori. Well, if you look at someone like Kant, like a priori is just within concepts of things that, are, you know, like I say, you know, a, a bachelor is always married, uh, is always unmarried, right? So a bachelor is always unmarried. 
that's what that that claim is present within the structure of the word. Okay, it's it's a priori. Mm. I don't think the presence of a god is. I don't think that is the same thing. I think I think it might depend on what perspective you you view things of. I mean, I I I I, I think I agree with you more than I would hypothetically not because, as I said, I I believe I believe more that we are because, for example, you know, I think personally from from what I from what I think at the moment, I'm I'm in agreement with you that you know child is instead of born a theist they're born an atheist because an atheist is like a non-stamp collector right and you don't have to point out that you don't collect stamps it's, it's even silly that it's a word but it's only a word because of the you know as you said the counter burden um of yeah, yeah, it's a the other side. yeah exactly so I, I i i agree with you more yeah i, I agree with you there um and, and what i've run into is you know theists sort of making making this claim that, well, maybe it just depends on your perception, because let's say we could say from, let's say, a more modern perspective that, yeah, I mean, where's God? But but then, you know, 2000 years ago, and I would argue down to ignorance, but that's debatable, um, down to ignorance, we'd say, oh, well, God is everywhere. You know? Oh, Zeus, thunder and lightning. You know, and uh, and so I, I think it depends. You can just, just make up perception. anything, though. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, I, well, yeah. That that's that's the kind of the thing, isn't it? Which, which I'm talking to theists, and I'm like, hey, look, that that doesn't quite add up there because you know people of the past they they put things, they they identify things like like Zeus, um, which is maybe a straw man because obviously that is a, I, I think, the monotheisms are are the ones where it's at, to be honest, um, because they actually have more sophisticated foundations i.e scriptures and and um and so-called revelations or whatever, whatever we want to call them uh, prophecies um and so because uh, as well as well as that um i think hitchens like to say and, and dawkins like there is much there is much evidence for the tooth fairy as there is a god and i think and again i'm i'm still working this out but I, I'm, I'm more on the side of agreement that technically, yes, because a fairy like like a deity has never been demonstrated. But but when I say demonstrated, and this is this is this is what shrouds this all around, which is it depends on what standard of evidence we're talking about. It really depends on the standard of perception and evidence we are assuming to 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 um, understand reality around us. So the standard of evidence, let's say, or somebody 2000 years ago, um, let's, let's um, divorce this from, from uh, religion, or, you know, perhaps, and, and let's just say, um, I don't know, my mind works better with, with religious examples, perhaps, I think. But, you know, if somebody, well, well it's, maybe it's the biblical stories, like, like the red mud. Okay, let's just say the red, let's just say, right. So, you know, the story of um, the rivers run red in Egypt and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Well, back then, 2000 years ago, it was probably most reasonable, considering you were 2000 years, you were living 2000 years ago and you had the Old Testament with you and your backpack. It was more reasonable as far as you were concerned to assume that the rivers did actually run red with blood. But 2,000 years later, it's more reasonable to assume, because of our standard of evidence being so much higher, actually, that was just red clay. It was just, it was just, it was just recolored because of the different um, stream um, channeling into another. So what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here, which, which I think theists, for me anyway, this is the kind of thing they try and say, which is, it depends on the standard of evidence that we're using to come to our conclusions about reality, because we could say atheism is an a priori, but at the same time, we are assuming it's an a priori because under the foundation of which we are perceiving reality, it is not under a religious perspective, it's under a secular perspective. So basically it depends on which perspective we are adopting to come to those conclusions about reality. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm in pretty much agreement with you, but I'm just, I just want to get your thoughts on that because these are just really interesting because I mean, you know, the phenomenology of perception, I've been reading that, um, take me bloody ages because it's so large and, and difficult to. Painfully take. difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it, it, 
and and Ima Gurukrist's um, The Martyr and His Emissary, like these kind of books, they kind of demonstrate that we really need to be more serious about what we mean by evidence and what we mean by demonstrate. Yeah. Um, I'd be careful with yeah. Gilchrist. I read a really interesting debate. Yeah. Well, not a very short. A debate between McGilchrist and another neuroscientist, a guy called okay. Keenan Malik. Okay. Okay. So, Ma and this is ridiculous. I don't know about any of this stuff. But I'm making it up as I go along. But <laughs> Keenan Malik had this really yeah. interesting yeah. debate with McGilchrist, um, and McGilchrist was an absolute prick in it. Um, it just like Google it later. I think I'm pretty sure it's a guy called Keenan Malik. And basically, okay. like, McGilchrist was like, uh, Malik was saying, okay, so you've made these assumptions about stuff. And so I have not read the book, but it's this left brain, left, right brain theory. Yeah. That, yeah. And essentially, societies are powered by one side of the brain, depending on the culture. And yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's one of his uh, conclusions, roughly. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But like... Malik was just basically saying like this is just an impossibly difficult thing to kind of uh, sort of get through. Like, with a, there's no fucking way you can make like that is an audacious claim. Mm. But but these two hemispheres are different, and like they're, you know, they they are it. So the brain is essentially, from what I understand, is just a huge network. And like yeah. there are regions responsible for the other, but you know, there's people with like severe brain injuries in one side and the network still functions so they can still do things that they really shouldn't be able to. Um, and so this, this postulating about this, these two sides of the brain, it, 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 powering cultures like this left brain, right? Uh, uh, Keenan Malik was just like, look, you really can't say this. And, and like um, McGilchrist came back at him, just like straw manning the fuck out of him, um, like being an absolute, not like, he was just like high progressive saying he like said things he'd never said. Um, it, it's, it's I've never seen him like that. I've, I've seen, I've seen, I really want to check out now. I've, I've, I've seen like interviews with with him a few of them um i don't know he seemed like a pretty chill guy but maybe he just got really triggered <laughs> he's i think he's chilled when he's not challenged and like this guy was like really polite like he wrote this blog and it was like really polite and saying oh, yeah. i love to hear ian's and and mcgilchrist came back and he's like you fucking cunt i'm not having this it's like sort of laid into it and it's like just just it was astonishing what a prick he was really um, it's, it's worth yeah. checking out yeah yeah i want to I, now you're well you're advertising you to me very yeah, well yeah. I'm, I'm always up for a for, for one of those um dramatic dramatic uh conflicts kind of it was things. really it's, unprofessional yeah honestly I, yeah. I think it was i was when i was reading it, i was like that's not like because i think he's like a medical doctor McGill Chris and then yeah. he went on to do other stuff but I was yeah. just like shit like this is not a well adjusted mm. person. like he was proper not so anyway I, I'm not sure about that whole thing I think like loads of people have read his book and said it's like fucking amazing but just like from from hearing the theory about it I'd be really careful yeah I mean he goes into it's like a it's like a thousand page book it's it's I, I reviewed it actually on my channel um, and yeah. it's probably one of my favorite books that I've read. Like, I just thought that, you know, not, not that I took it all as it came, but I was like, there are clearly some interesting ideas here. And I just, and in the review, I was just like, there's just so much in the book to think about, whether it's true or false. And um, w w I mean, I, I think 400 pages is dedicated to the whole like cultural brain, left brain, right brain thing. Um, and it, intuitively it made sense. Um, although obviously on a technical level, who am I to who am I to concur on that? Um, but it's, it's a, I, I would recommend the book because regardless of whether that might be false, um, he talks about belief as well in a really interesting way. And it's funny because Jordan Peterson, sorry, I brought Jordan Peterson up again. It's mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson, I can tell that he was is heavily inspired by Miguel Chris. Like I, you know. When I liked him more, I, I, I still like watching his um, uh, debates or interviews because he has interesting guests and I like, you know, um, some of what he has to say. Um, but, but what I found was a lot of his ideas should be credited 
to McGill Christ because mm-hmm. honest, like honestly, I was reading his book, The Master and the Emissary. I was reading that and I was like, Jordan Peterson has been saying this in his lectures. And He's all, it. Yeah. and the whole time I was like, You didn't mention him once, by the way. <laughs> I mean, he's yeah. he's recommended, like, don't get me wrong. He has actually talked to Miguel Chris, I think, a couple of times. And he has um, he has mentioned him. But to the extent of how many ideas are Miguel Chris and how many ideas Pete's or Pete's and acts as if they are, um, it feels like one of, like, most of what Peterson says when it comes to belief, let's say, he articulates it so poorly, Peterson, but but McGilchrist, he he writes it so well. He explains it beautifully. And I could, I was just like, yeah, Peterson, I, I, I see that you read this book, but you were just clearly not able to describe it in the same way that McGilchrist can. Yeah. So that was kind of, that was kind of, um, kind of bizarre. Yeah. It's interesting. So I've got this question to ask you about, Pete. <laughs> right. And right. Fucking... Okay. So you did do you work in a drug and alcohol rehabilitation unit? I did. Or like, yeah. yeah. Did you advise any of your patients to fly to Russia and go in an induced coma to cure their addiction? <laughs> uh no. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I funny didn't. that. Yeah, strange funny. though, isn't it? Yeah, funny. Almost that. like yeah. it's uh, not yeah. true, or doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever. I I don't know the details because I think that Peterson's case, from what I could, he, what I understood, it was quite a specific combination of things. Um, because it had to do with his diet, it had to do with his um, part of depression and and other mental illnesses. So I think it is a combination of a lot of different things. Um, and and there's I don't know if you watched his um, his his interview uh, Michaela Peterson I think led it but it was him talking about his you know his experience and it's got like a few million views um, conveniently posted on Michaela's YouTube first yeah one yeah. Funny, isn't um, it? yeah but um, but in that he he explains that it's basically a combination of things and you know when I was watching I'm I'm not to be honest with you I'm not really I don't know. I don't know, like from what I have, what I've seen, what I heard from him, it was a combination of things, and the only option that they had apparently was what they what they ended up doing, mm-hmm. and and what would be recommended normatively was, and it didn't work, and so they you know they they had to they had to go to these Russian doctors to you know, <laughs> get whatever done to them who were still living <laughs> underground from the Soviet Union uh yeah i mean look i i don't know the full story <laughs> I, I don't know the full story it's just a, yeah i can tell you now it doesn't make any medical sense it's nonsense something else happened i don't know what i, do, I don't well, know what he died that tells you enough i guess i mean to be fair he looked like shit when he came back yeah but uh there's, he, he uh, honestly yeah. looks like he's aged about 15 years yeah yeah since since that maybe that's just his diet maybe but yeah yeah i mean all all meat yeah i mean and and his uh michaela's on that as well the lion diet i believe it's called yeah she uh, looks all right to be fair but pete's yeah. Yeah, although I don't know, that there might there might be a um a beauty bias uh, between you looking at Peterson and Michaela. But, absolutely, yeah, certainly is. She's a terrible, terrible person. There, have you have you seen any of this? Uh, this is we're so off piece. I can't even <laughs> believe it. But like, she's like, have you seen her weird? She's got like weird kind of. It's not like multi level marketing, but it's like that kind of thing, like. She's got weird like friendship groups and stuff, but like a grand, like you have to pay a grand to like have like a really face to face. Yeah, like she's, I haven't heard she's, that. She's, okay, she's sketchy as fuck. Honestly, they're well, both just like petty criminal con men <laughs> types. They're really yeah, good well, at it, but that's you know. Yeah, I mean, Michaela now has her own interviewing and and things like that, and I, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I mean, I think. In one regard, I think, 
I think she definitely has, you know, the diet things and her 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 mental health issues. I think that I think there is something to be said about her um, speaking out about that and educating people about her experience. I think that's quite cool. Um, but and I, in a way, I don't know. In a way, I think I don't know because I'm half and half about this. Because in one sense, I'm like she made the most out of her dad being Jordan Peterson. She fucking did. Yeah. Like while he was in yeah. the hospital. She was doing all this bullshit stuff. Like she was like, "Come and come and be my friend. Like we can talk. We we have like a special group. It's only a thousand dollars a month." Really though, like, I, I haven't heard of that. Seriously, really, fucking look it up. Jesus. Honestly, it's fucking astonishing. Really? Okay. It's just yeah. I hope I'm not slap like doing libel stuff, but like I'm pretty sure it's out there. Have a look. Hey, look, I, I've got a, I may I've, be wrong. I've, I've got a, I've got a bit of research to do after this. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, the sound, um, or, or, the, or the article that I, that I must have missed as well. Um, and uh, you know, oh, the, shit, yeah, of course. And um, what, what was the other? Um, when oh, we, shit, right. Yeah, if we get back to sound, should we talk about what's his bloody name? He's called. Why well, is the Bergson guy? Okay, so sorry rearranging some things and I'm going to look at my piece of paper because I'm now drunk, okay? <laughs> uh, what's he bloody called? Jean-Marc Vallée. I didn't even see it on the paper. It came to me before. Okay, so we've been at this a while now. So I don't know if anyone's still here. Any fans of True Detective need to work, watch Sharp Objects. Have you seen Sharp Objects? Have, have I? Yeah. No, I only I only read the article about the objects, but I but I haven't seen it yet. It's sort of it's got Amy Adams in it, right? It's yeah, so, yeah, so precisely. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's it's a so it's a Gillian Flynn novel, right? So I I think among literary people, it's like oh, fuck that shit, but it's a <laughs> fucking really well put together series. So the the yeah. uh, director is a guy called John Mark Ballet, and he's like got really specific editing style but just just to say the show is fucking amazing so it's like beautifully put together like the directing's brilliant the, the acting obviously is top notch unfortunately the plot is gonna i think you'll like it man i think it i think it might put you off but it's so well put together it's kind of better than anything else bar five percent of things but it's the closest kind of production you know that kind of weird like so darkly spirit not spiritual but like kind of slightly dark occult semi semi yeah precisely a cult yeah. kind of vibe okay i've never seen anything comes as close to true detective as that that's okay. quite a claim that's quite a claim I'll take you at Honestly, your word, man. <laughs> it's fucking really good. I've only watched it drunk, but pretty much watched everything well, drunk. But, yeah, well, <laughs> it, the enlightened so, experience. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, so. It's difficult to talk about. So, Bergson. So, Henry Bergson, right, is a French mm. philosopher. Mm. You know what? If Sebastian sees this, he's going to fucking tear me to pieces. <laughs> I'm Let's hope shit. he doesn't. Yeah, let's say Peterson. So, but basically, Bergson is, he was like a, a interested in time. Okay, so he wrote a book, I think, called Time and Free Will, right? So this is related, in which he talks about the, the two different elements of time, right? So you have a clock ticking, the empirical uh, measurement of time, okay? And then you have the human experience of time, which it, he argues it completely different right so and i would kind of argue the same thing with sound okay there is something out there there is some force there is some it's not force but it's like a scientific thing going on that is measurable but human beings don't get the full component of it and we have a different experience you know so like the the idea that notes make a chord together that's that is a human experience right there's no there's no reason to believe there's anything else going on other than a human experience. The, the, the notes themselves, your friend said it, it, it can't be anything else. Hmm. And so Bergson's theory of time is really interesting. So 
he kind of posits that time is it's interesting actually. So Bergson debated Einstein uh, about time and like apparently like gave him a fucking hard time. Like he's really <laughs> clever. A so hard like, time. Like busy... there. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. So he was like really clever like he was like a physicist first I think like Kant uh, and then he like went on to like the sort of philosophical sort of stuff uh, but so he talks about time in this experiential sort of virtualistic way I hope I hope Vice doesn't watch this because you know fucking tell me to bits he's gonna anyway, flip. So he, yeah. yeah he's gonna is gonna fuck up they fucking do me in but so anyway so he talks about this virtualistic kind of uh, sensation and sort of t- the time we live with okay so he talks about it as being there uh, i heard another guy talk about it uh, this guy called absurd being okay so he's got a great series on bergson and he talks about bergson's sort of it, 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 describing our experience of time as um something like uh so it's like a feeling of like being in the present but constantly uh, informed by the past Okay, so it's like this this constant link. It's never one thing. It's kind of leaning into the future and experiencing the present, but always linked to the past. Um, and it's kind of like sort of multi-sensual. So you can be hearing about, or you can be hearing one thing, but thinking about another, like surely all the time, like you have some idiot like jabbering on, you can kind of hear it. You're thinking about, you know, some time in the past some special occasion where you shot somebody and got away with it or whatever you know made you excited at the time and so the past drives all our future experiences and our kind of um our present is this this kind of multi time experience but always rolling forward Okay, it's, it's this really complex sort of mix of different times, but in one experience. Um, and so Jean-Marc Vallée, uh, the producer for this, and like he's made loads of films. I think he did Dallas Buyers Club. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so loads of other yeah. stuff. I don't know if he uses editing sort of audio technique in his, mm. in his productions then, but from what I've seen, he did the best sort of, um, the best ever... Uh, interpretational kind of like um, production of visual human memory systems that I've ever seen. Okay, so what he does is he um, he kind of creates the visual edit of these interconnected moments from the past. So this woman, uh, Amy Adams, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's someone who's like, had traumatic experiences in the past. And so you probably know about this, that like people often has kind of flashback type experiences or they have anxieties where they're constantly referring to previous things that they've been affected by, uh, rolling through the future, right? So like, I don't know, maybe they're agoraphobic and they're like scared of getting on the bus and they're like at home, but worrying about the future of their mm. past experience. So they're getting on the bus, but they're worried about going out the door and they, they have this rolling multi idea of things, but always going forward, right? Because time's always going forward, right? Experience is jumping through these different virtual states. Um, and so Jean-Marc Vallée he, in, in Sharp Objects does this fantastic sort of stuff where uh, the audio is created in in an amazing way. So all the sound, all the music and everything is locational, okay? So if Amy Adams is driving in the car and listening to music, you only hear music that is situational. So it's coming out of the car speakers, okay? Everything is environmental. So if there's music on in the house, the music is on on a stereo in the house. Mm. You're not hearing an overlaid audio thing. Yeah. What they do yeah. is they, they, they produce this hyper real audio where all the sonic elements in the building are um, much louder than normal. So things like fans, uh, cars, people chatting in the background, um, like any kind of sound effect is really heightened. So you get this really interesting sort of like really vivid soundscape all the time. Um, 
And that is then uh, kind of coupled with um, other stuff. So like what he'll do is he'll cre create scenes where she's driving. Okay, So she'll be driving down the highway and she'll be listening to some music. And you'll have the sound, the soundscape is in the present, right? So it's music on in the car. It's not overlaid on the soundtrack. It's on in the car. You've got the wind blasting by, you've got hand sounds in the car, like touching things, banging around. So you can hear all the environmental stuff. Then what it does is he'll edit the visuals to fit a kind of timeline of the past, which shows what, what it does is creates this really strange imagery where you get these these tiny snapshots, these little flickers of the past, but with the sound of the present, which which creates a strange kind of uh, dislocation. You know, the, they might call it schizophonia, uh, in where where I sort of studied, which is like this dislocation of the audio and and the and the sort of visual sense, which is a really interesting way of of representing these memory flashbacks because that's pretty much how it works for us, right? You know, you're on the bus and you're thinking about something or you're uh, stood in the street or you're going for a walk and the brain is constantly flicking up these images, going through mm. the past, but, but the senses are still in the present. So you're hearing yeah. the things around you and stuff. It's fucking cool. Like, firstly, Bergson is cool as fuck. Um, Again, Sebastian, I'm sorry if this is bad, uh, but uh, Bergson's theory is cool. He might be wrong, but I'm, I'm kind of like that with philosophy. I like stuff that's kind of interesting rather than right. Uh, just like, <laughs> yeah, I, just I like... have that. I have that tendency myself. I mean, a lot of people are like, well, why would you, why would you enjoy reading about theology if you don't think it's true? Yeah. And I don't, the thing is, I don't think I'm, just reading theology i'm reading culture i'm reading psychology i'm reading history so not only is theology more than just religion it encapsulates a lot more um and it, it's all in, interconnected and so i'm you know i i really relate to you in the sense that i'm interested in things that are just outright interesting rather than necessarily right just just the mental gymnastics yeah. the, the the mental fireworks of of considering this even though you i mean it's like the sapphire wolf hypothesis in arrival the film and in the uh based on the short story i don't know you've seen arrival have you yeah i think you know what i hated yeah. arrival i've got what? i've got my own wow okay so, okay okay I, okay i thought it was i thought it was brilliantly put together yeah yeah the final narrative of torturing that fucking kid so she could have a bit of fun or whatever she I, if i was like this is yeah. bullshit yeah yeah well yeah i mean that uh, that element of the story is ethical <laughs> I, I, yeah 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 that's just like what as like, soon as it got to the end i was like is that what this has been about you idiot <sighs> dear me honestly well it's just and, but, but it was it's yeah. this pronatal sort of theme, isn't it? In in well, in in life in general, isn't it? Yeah, but that yeah. was sociopathic. I think just like it was to please her and nobody else. Garbage. But that's you know my but the sanctity of life, right? <laughs> Shit. I don't know. Just have a drink. Do something else. You don't need to do that. But that's you know. But but yeah, so yeah, I think we're on the same page with that kind of stuff. Yeah. So even like yeah. Kant, like Emmanuel Kant was like basically wrong about everything. He was but wrong like, in a really but, interesting way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And also he was wrong, but what he said, but his main contribution was just saying the way we're doing things now can't be right. That's what a critique is, right? Mm. So the critique of pure reason was just like a response to Hume saying these things can't quite be right and that is you know i th i think he was he was right for that but mm. it's too complex i don't know if you ever tried to read that bastard but it's just yeah absolutely well yeah 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 and no, i've i've read um <laughs> i've got um i've got one of the great books with his collection of his stuff i think critique of pure reason is in there and then 
I'm pretty sure I, I get confused because it was a while ago that I read it, but I think critique of pure reason is the is when he, um, you know, has the has the um, uh, categorical categorical imperative, that's, right? That, yeah, that's, yeah. That, well, yes, it, yeah. Well, well, yes, it's like, yeah, it's like about synthetic a priori knowledge, yeah. and that uh, as this new category of thinking, yeah, um, it, and and then it goes into like different sort of categories of like because there's like transcendental aesthetic and then the trans yeah I, I remember that being a bit to read I, I was really struggling yeah. at that point it's, yeah. it is grueling uh yeah. I fucking get it. I listened to a few YouTube videos after a bit and I was like oh I get the picture fuck this I'm not reading this mm. book this is too bloody difficult it, so, I mean it, Sam Harris's moral landscape is basically just a worse yeah. worse written and arguably clearer version of Kant's categorical comparative because he yeah, but Kant Kant yeah. thought it was okay to kill kids, like it wasn't a moral problem to kill kids who were born outside of wedlock. He thought it was all right. Well, like, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess with all these historical figures, we need to separate, like, Schopenhauer, <laughs> Schopenhauer about his, his comments on women. Um, yeah, yeah, but so, but, yeah. but Schopenhauer's comments on women weren't really part of his philosophy, really. I mean, Kant's ethics are pretty fucking weird. I can't remember him, um, like, with the ethics being tied to the, <laughs> to the you need to watch it right so there's a channel called carefree wandering okay there, and it's this german he's a philosophy professor yeah he goes through like loads of stuff he's fucking really good he talks about the ukraine crisis recently he's talked about loads of stuff but he talks about Kant's ethics and it's fucking hilarious he's really good he's called hans muller or something like that but he's fucking he's <laughs> how good. did you find him I, like, don't, I don't think he typed his name in <laughs> No, no, he yeah. just came up in my feed as it yeah. does. Yeah, yeah, that name. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised you didn't you didn't manually search that. German yeah. is not not too easy. Yeah, the algorithm got me. Can I just nip to the loop? Like, for yeah, two no, worries. no worries, no worries, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's, that's what happens right. when you drink beer. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're left alone, me and you, viewer. Uh, yeah, it's been this conversation has been really interesting, and it's because I only did the philosophy of music um, video with with Mauricio um, a few weeks ago, but I think that it's it's so interesting how you can kind of turn turn a subject into <laughs> loads of different ways. You you can you can interpret in so in so many different ways, and there are also different subcategories of. The philosophy of music and mm -hmm. as as we could tell from um from the from this discussion um but if you guys haven't i'm sure some of you have checked out um the bartered episodes with nick but um yeah they were really they were really good as well the last one we we really got i think it's called the phenomenal the phenomenology of bastard perception is the title on uh, on my channel um where, where we talked to him and yeah it was it was great we really go deep into the abyss um yeah so i'd recommend watching you guys watching uh my other conversations with nick with uh gc mckay and cody second um yeah so hope you guys are enjoying it um i guess that's what happens when you when you drink beer you go straight straight through as you guys could tell i'm more of a, a rum whiskey person for that reason actually during during these kind of conversations it it's far more convenient drinking less sorry sorry dude yeah. no yeah. worries no. Oh, my no, blood no worries. is not what it used to be i'm i'm old no no worries i was just um i was just talking um about you behind behind your back it's fine you'll yeah. that's fine. <laughs> um that's no, fine. I, I'm, I'm used to it what I what I was saying was on the last time I was saying, which was you know talking to myself in the present, but obviously not in the future, which is a mind bending thing in itself. Um, YouTube is a lot like that. It's all it's all really mind bending. Like I'm literally talking to myself. You know what I mean? But but, but in oh, the shit, future, yeah, I'm of course not. you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I sound like a freak to somebody who's just like probably looking over like with some you know just me orating to nothing. Um, but I was saying like. 
I really don't understand how these like in-person live debates, how these people can not go to the bathroom in four hours and they're yeah, drinking and drinking water as well. It's like in, in the debates that I've seen, like Matt Dillahundi, um, Peterson, like, you know, their debate and Sam Harris and, and Brett Weinstein, like, all of them are drinking water, which is, it goes straight through. And I'm like, how do you not need to go to the bathroom? Like, are you, because if it was me, I'd just, be, I'd just be like, surely it'd be really embarrassing. Just like, oh yeah, um, there's a live debate. I just need to, just need to go. I, I've never understood how, They've mastered. It's less that. embarrassing than just pissing yourself. Well, I mean, considering that's <laughs> I mean, the only like... other option. <laughs> I, so, I, so I, can I, you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, shit. Like, you know, I mean, I could, if you wanted to, I could have just sat here and pissed myself, but it was not. I don't think it would have helped you. <laughs> I well, it might, it, might, of our the, it might make the discussion go viral, which I have to thank you for at the end of the day. But Well, yeah, that's true. Oh, shit. So on this, so, so I just thought about the other bastards briefly. Yeah. Because we don't live in the present. We live in... A oh, yeah. Co- okay, so Co- Cody might like this. Okay, so I'm sure he'll be d- deeply aroused, okay? He won't. He may never hear it. But there's this interesting uh, theory about ghosts, right? Because <laughs> oh, I know I'm sure, he's like. I'm sure, a... I'm sure half the audience will absolutely loathe this. Go ahead. <laughs> Absolute. Oh no, no, they might. They might do. So they might do, but they might not. So it's it's more about his ghostly eroticism and like what might. Really definitely love that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, ghosts. I'm not a, I'm not a believer, right? I don't believe in ghosts, but it turns out there might be a sonic explanation for them. So basically what they've discovered is, so you've heard of ultrasound, right? Which is yeah. like sound, you know, you do scans on people. It's like really high frequency, it mm. bounces back. You can see things. That's crazy. But the diff- yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, so that's the high, that's the higher end. That's like anything beyond our hearing really is like, I don't know what the category for ultrasound is, but it's fucking high up. Mm. Really high frequency vibrations. But the opposite side of that is infrasound, right? So human beings hear down to about 20 hertz, uh, which is really low. And like, I probably can't hear that anymore. You might be able to, but it's, it's hard to know for sure. But sounds below that level still generate sort of human like you can feel it and that's there's an interesting evolutionary theory about this uh and so like basically like i said before in a natural soundscape in nature there's very few actually really low frequency sounds because the lower a sound is the more energy it takes to produce right i don't know if you've ever been to like a um to a part to like a nature park or Somewhere where there's lions, right? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen a lion. I, yeah, I, I've I've seen zoos. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so lions, right? When they when they roar, they create infrasound because they're fucking massive. But it's the way their bodies are set up, right? right. So they make the, make a lion's roar, and it creates like a really low frequency rumble, right? And not many other things do this in nature. Okay. Something that loud and that low specifically is, is really unusual. Thunder as well maybe does that. So really fucking loud, but it's really low, right? It's really low because it takes all that energy to, to move the air at that low frequency. It just takes much, much more energy. That's why low frequency things like bass give that impression of like power because it's very difficult to produce. And so what... <laughs> what happened was many years ago a guy installed some new um machinery i think I, I could be totally fucking this up but we'll get there anyway new machinery into a hospital room okay so it was some kind of like generator or something that created these really low frequency waves so there was infrasound waves that um kind of what they do is because you can't hear them but you can still feel them okay so they resonate through your body so you can feel like 
something strange going on, but you can't quite register it properly. Um, and so there's stories of this guy installing this hardware in this hospital and like people walking into these rooms and feeling like really weird sensations of terror, like deep sort of terror. And people seeing things like seeing, uh, you know, people see orbs. Have you heard of people seeing orbs and like yeah. weird stuff yeah. around these these ghost sightings? Yeah. Okay, so mm. what the, what this guy sort of posited and they started to discover was this machinery was causing like low frequency standing waves in this room, in this basement room. And like anyone who walked in started to feel really anxious and stressed. And what, what at a certain frequency it was doing was it was vibrating people's ocular nerves and making them see like, uh, they, they weren't quite sure what it was. It was that vibrating like the viscous fluid in the eye. Jeez. And sometimes that makes you see like little spots and stuff. Uh, and so like there's loads of theories about haunted places actually having some kind of low frequency um vibration going on it is causing these like senses of terror and the reason it causes a sense of terror is because it's well basically i heard someone else say this it's nature's way of telling you to shit your pants right like if it's like a lion roaring or an elephant roaring at you you fucking dead it's time to run away okay so those low frequency sounds are a warning sign and if you don't actually have the, the part that you can hear perceptibly, but you just have the bottom end that is vibrating your body, it causes like this sense of real unease. And I think that is a lot to do with why people have these strange sensations. I'm not saying it's true or not. I'm just mm. saying that's a theory. That's very, very fucking interesting. Hmm. Definitely worth considering. Yeah. Like, cause like basically, in the world we live in now, there's things all over the place causing these kinds of vibrations. And of course, you don't, you're not really looking for them. And like, you know, this microphone is really expensive. We would never find them because they're too low. You know, you'd need something else to detect them. But you can feel them. So you've said before, like you've been in nightclubs, you can feel those waves going through your body, right? Yeah, yeah. When it's really loud and really yeah. low. But you can't, if, if that was only that, You'd be like, what the fuck is going on? It's really weird. And so it's an interesting theory. So it's not, I've got to say, I'm not a ghost fan. I'm not interested in demons. But it's weird, isn't it? It's a weird idea. Yeah, I mean, I'm th that that's completely new to me. And I'm just, to me at all, I mean, intuitively and from an from an evidential perspective from 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 what you how you've described the process it feels it feels like a plausible idea whether we know it is true or not but it, it feels like a very plausible idea just from how you've described it um because basically a lot of mysteries are only mysteries because science hasn't explained it yet and that that's pretty much more it's the definition of, of a mystery in some um in some context um i've never heard of that though that's really interesting yeah. yeah it's a weird idea isn't it but like apparently so like there's like bits of like shitty information out there but apparently like they've done some study i don't know some studies somewhere and there's a, a something that's like a certain percentage of people who are exposed felt a deep sense of unease and blah 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 could be garbage but it's probably more likely than fucking ghosts oh yeah every day of the week is more likely than than ghosts i mean if, if you if you posit that it is ghost what kind of ghost what islamic yeah. judaism christian yeah. i mean yeah. the, the proof as as we said porcupine before. yeah and like what animals have ghosts fuck knows yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the burden of proof is far larger on the theistic side. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with the infrasound theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not unsurprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, so it's a funny idea. And like, I thought maybe we could like rent a room and get some machines, like put Cody in, see what happens yeah. to him. 
Yeah, no, I, th- I think he'd probably have a seizure just to enjoy it so much. Um, yeah, be like full maximal pleasure. But then his life would be ruined because he couldn't have it back. Well, his wife would also be arbitrary, which would be... <laughs> <insane>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You never see you never see daylight ever again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so anyway, that's one that's one spooky thing. That was the secret thing I'd kept. The, <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad you didn't forget to bring it up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. How how are we how are we doing with time? Are you uh I'm, I'm gonna have to go pretty soon, to be honest. No worries. Um, no worries. More, more that I think I've drunk quite a lot of beers now. But do I'm I need to probably... call an ambulance to pump your chest or something? No. <laughs> you'll be all right. You'll they, be all good. If they came, they'd just be like, fuck this guy. He's wasted his time. <laughs> uh, it'd be no. Wait, what, <laughs> be why, no, uh... why is he telling me about alternative arguments to the paranormal? Uh, yeah, I'd just be like, yeah. fuck, fuck you. I'm not having any of that infrasound bullshit. <laughs> Make me possessed. Well, yeah, it's been it's been it's been great to have you on, Nick. Uh, I mean, especially as this is your first appearance on uh, on my you know channel as a one to one conversation. It's it's really good to have you on. Um, yeah, yeah, man. It's always good to talk to you. I'd like yeah. you know, this would be great at the pub. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. There's plenty more where this came from, but I always get waylaid. Especially with the bastards, it's impossible to get to any points. I tried to talk about Nick Land last time. I ended up just smashed at the end of the session, rambling. <laughs> so, well, you know, if it's on any consolation, I, I was I, I was going on religious tangents. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Cody has his, uh, Cody has his um, uh, socialism and capitalism tangents. GC Mackay has his quantum mechanics tangents i have my religious tangents you know we, we all have our we all have our poison i'm afraid yeah i'm not sure oh yeah yeah sure mine is really just well your poison is quite literally else. alcohol in this scenario <laughs> yeah yeah this you know it works for me for now so yeah but yeah it's been a blast man i'd like i'll, I'll come back anytime if you think of anything i love you to watch sharp objects and, um, yeah, no, I'll check that out. Is it? Is it one I, season as well? I, I, I saw. I it's only one season. Yeah, yeah it's just I eight it and I was like, oh, that's pretty short. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like, it's really strange because, like, for, for you especially, or for like, uh, so uh, you know, my partner is a CBT therapist as well. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about CBT. I wonder if yeah, we. <laughs> you, yeah, the, you, you're also entertaining. Um, uh, bringing her on the bastards podcast, or, or if that's yeah, not safe, if if that's not well, safe, perhaps you you too. I don't know. But. Well, do you know? So yeah, so I'd like to, but the thing with the like you and Cody kicking the fuck out of those guys unsettled her. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, especially Cody when he was talking about like I don't know. She, I'm sure she'll be fine. She's downstairs now. But um, we'll, we'll just 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 we, uh, get her to watch this one and know that I'm not some sort of serial killer. No. Oh yeah, she come on talk to you. I'm sure. But um, <laughs> I mean, she likes the other guys. Don't get me. Or she hasn't listened to any of the times I've come on. It was a great, um, it was yeah, a great it was, episode. You got her to got her to uh, listen to. Yeah, <laughs> very convenient. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, totally. It's just one of the she just walked in. Um, okay, so shit, I can't remember the two things that I wanted to talk about. Oh, so I was talking about sharp objects, really yeah. quick. Definitely yeah. worth watching. Yeah. Oh yeah, and the tra- so the trauma parts of it and like re-experiencing trauma is really well done. So that's that Bergsonian thing, but it's like, you know, quite often characters are going through their day, but they're having these flashbacks to trauma. In it. And I, I don't know, I'd be interested, like drop me an email or whatever, let me know what you think about it. Well, it's it's also even more appropriate considering one of the, so get this right, the models that I, that I picked for my last year of university was psychology of religion and psychology of the paranormal um, and psychology oh, of trauma. So Fuck. I'll be reading loads of trauma books i'm going to prepare okay. for the third year um pretty hard um so i'm going to be reading a lot of i think there's one called the body keeps the score and cbt therapists as well who i'm working with uh recommend some really good really good um 
uh, trauma books. I can't off the top of my head because I've just added them. But, um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if your wife would be up for it, but but it would be interesting to talk about psychology, CBT. Um, I, I'd really be good with that. Yeah, she's, she's been doing it for like 10 years. She's like really does loads of it. Um, That's cool. But so, but like, so I've been a, not <laughs> a victim. I was going to say I've been a victim of CBT. Yeah. Not a victim, yeah. but I would say I've had CBT in the past, right. right? And so this is my this is my complaint. She won't hear me. Okay, maybe you'll hear me. You'll maybe you'll, you know, I forgot what it's called <laughs> when you like acknowledge someone. Okay. But basically, my theory about CBT is a bit weird. So you can say anything. I, I could say. You know, like both my kids were eaten by a pack of dogs and then like I escaped, but I like had to live in the jungle for nine months and I was like dying. And then like, I lost an arm. And when I came back, like I was like crying and all this stuff happened. And then like I got trafficked to Japan for six years and then I came back. And then you go and you say all this to your CBT therapist and like, OK, well, we've got this document for you to fill in. <laughs> all you need to do is say, how sad you were on Friday. Yeah. And then on Monday, if you were a bit more happy, well, then that's a good thing. Okay. So then, and it's just like, what the fuck is going on? Like, well, well, I, don't, I don't know what kind of CBT therapist you, you saw, but I mean, that's, yeah, that's pretty like, that's like a first session without even knowing your client kind of thing to do. I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that rubs me the wrong way as well. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's very strange CBT because it's like very like based on sort of things that you um it's all like score charts and weird like well my experience of it was like loads of like planning and kind of like quantifying and sort of like loads of it's almost like databasey kind of weird things where you do all these exercises I was just like, some really fucked up shit's happened to me. I don't want to fill in a fucking spreadsheet mm. about it. I want to like... There are, there are like work, there, there can be worksheets that are available, but I would, I would really hope that that, <laughs> that method as a singularity wouldn't be the, wouldn't, wouldn't be the agenda. Um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I had just had a bad experience because like, to be fair, my therapist did dump me via text message, which Amy nearly complained about. Because, like, she just texted me one day and said, oh, by the way, you seem to be all right now. Let's go. <laughs> right. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Was that, like, NHS or private? No. Well, no, I was paying for it. It was, like, a really strange, like, um, it was, like, a, a thing where you paid, like, a certain amount. It's, like, a semi-funded but, but sort of semi-participant-funded thing. But it was just like my experience of CBT was just like, this is fucking shit. Like, it's just, mm. but obviously my girlfriend does it for a job. So well, I I, the thing is, and, and I and I say this in my review of Cracked, why, psycho, why, psycho, why psychiatry does more harm than good, which uh, was my last review that came out. And what I say is that not to discount people's bad experiences because that there, there is something to be said for that but there's also the idea that it's very easy to have one experience and define a field or or psychiatry for that matter um or you know or, or subject within that um paint it with the brush that you experienced it with um that time and and what i was saying in the review is like i think when we look at the scripture uh of of psychiatry which is um the uh the D dsm um when, when we look at that there are clearly uh, many issues of that for example that th there are many there are many theories that aren't even used anymore but they are still in the dsm because according to one of the co-creators of it it would confuse us more if we just pluck things out and pluck things back in again because it would be more obvious that it is so subjective as it is so in that regard i think that the scripture of psychiatry is there's a lot wrong with it my review is is, is more in depth but basically i think there's a lot wrong with it but what i say at the end is basically what's your what's the alternative because um you know it's sebastian for example he's not fond of psychiatry as a subject and and 
I guess the only thing, you know, with all the technicalities aside, I'm just like, okay, but what is the alternative? And when there is no alternative, I think, is it better to stick with our guns or is it better to abolish something entirely? And I think this, this, this question not only extends to psychiatry, but also politics, like for example, capitalism, like, you know, whilst we can point out the, 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 the inconsistencies of capitalism, if we, if we, if we um, pull the rug too fast or at all, chaos will ensue. So the question is, is it better to have um, profound temporary chaos or I guess, I guess going along with what we've always had and there's a level of order, but also there's still that struggle that and inequality. And so either way you lose. This is, this is, this, this, this goes back to what I said before as well with, um, with the coping mechanism thing. It's like either way, you're still going to come into a, a big issue, which is taking the rug out. There are going to be consequences. And if you don't have a good substitute, i.e. if socialism, Marxism doesn't work in the way you want it to, you basically just doomed the economy. You've doomed pretty much the world, depending on which, you know, in, in the West, let's say, if the US did it. Um, you pretty much even the world because the US is so contingent on other countries. Um, yeah. So, and that's, but, you know, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. It, yeah, it's so my opinion is capitalism has doomed the world, yeah. but also made it better temporarily, right? So, I had, I had this really interesting thing. Uh, great, really good uh, AI scientist called Yosha Back. Okay, so he talks about capitalism really interestingly. He so, sort of says like, okay, so since the Industrial Revolution, we've essentially burned 100 million years worth of solar power, right, in the past 150 years. Because all that power was just put into trees, which then went underground, turned into oil, then into coal. And, you know, the, the capitalism and and and, and um, energy, they're the two. That's where it is, right? There's not really, it, it's, it's basically energy. Mm. Basically. Uh, and so he says, like, the, the human race, really interesting pattern, right? So it kind of rose at very slow. And, and we had a certain amount of people, not many. And then I think we rolled around at about 400 million people or up to a billion people, like 150 years ago. And then we started to exploit these resources. We found the tech to exploit oil, coal, these kinds of things. And, and how it looks on a graph is uh, how locusts look when they are hibernating for like all this time. And then they, they, they raise out rain in their billions and exploit all the resources. And then there's an, an inevitable downturn. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that is kind of how this is looking like. Yeah. Essentially, capitalism has treated the environment as an externality, right? mm. as, as something that has no cost. And so, and so all, the, all the pollution and devastation caused by the use of fossil fuels, it's been known for, to, to be fair, the damage was done a long time ago, right? But it's been known for a long time as well that, that this was happening. And it, and it appears to be now unlocking like various different feedback loops and uh, melting, uh, you know, ice caps and other places that are releasing more fossil, uh, not fossil fuel, fuels, but greenhouse gases. Um, uh, shit, I can't remember precise. Uh, methane, okay, so loads of methane, yeah, methane. is locked up in the yeah. ice. And yeah. It's causing feedback loops, okay, so... But so, so it could be the case, okay, that, that capitalism has created a, a temporary boost to us in, in our lifestyles. Uh, but, it, you know, my opinion is that it, it's mixed, right? So we have a, a, we can buy what we want in the supermarkets, but people are still pissed off all the time. Most people are still exploited. Um, you know, we have like the, the, the raise in standard of living is one thing, yeah. okay, but it, it's not really equating to that high quality of life for, for as far as I can see. And, and then the, the offshot of this is looking like some kind of terminal biosphere decline, right? So 
Um, would socialism be different? I don't fucking know. I, I, I doubt it. I think human beings are self-terminating species. I, I can't see any, any political system that would hold that. Um, but I definitely think capitalism has, you know, really fucked us. Um, Poisoned us. I think, I think like, the, the, the basic thing uh, that would help was that if corporations just paid their fucking taxes. <laughs> um, that, that seems to be, to me, like, I, I know, like, code is, like, far harder to the left and probably GC is as well. From my, from my opinion, like, in a realistic sense, the base, the mo- basic first step to making things better is to get corporations to pay their fucking taxes. And that is something that just doesn't happen at all. Um, or it's, or, you know, routinely, it's just robbing from the public. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I think that would be a place to start. I don't think there is a solution, frankly. I don't think our species is going to go on massively long well um, as, but, as russ cole says we're an unfortunate mutation um, yeah yeah on on, on evol- of evolution um yeah, yeah. on that on that um revelatory note um yeah i, I think i'm flagging like you are yeah me too mate um and we I've don't been work all day as well you. i've walked like seven miles today or something so Jesus. wrecked yeah no well it's yeah, so I'm I'm glad that we that we've um, stopped where we did because uh, maybe next time we can talk more about politics. Not not that I'm not that I know too much about it. I'm still reading about it and and, and thinking about it. But I'm I'm sure we have so many other things to discuss uh, for yeah. another time. But yeah, thank you. Sure. I hope, hope that you uh, you know get some rest after your work and now your contribution to you know the conversation and. Yeah, I'm very, very appreciative. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. A, it's a blast every time, man. Like, hit me up whenever you want. I didn't see you drinking, though. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I don't know if you watched the, the live yesterday, but um, I was drinking my Johnny Walker Black, so I thought mm. I would give it a bit of a rest uh, today. <laughs> yeah. Fair yeah. Dues, man. Fair yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, no, it's a blast every time so and I, I, I feel like it didn't get into sound that much but then i've forgotten most of what i, I, I don't know I, I think i think i think i think 70 percent of 60 percent of the conversation was was relevant to that i mean the thing is with these kind of conversations like like we said from the output the outset it's you know this is at the end of the day a free conversation and things take us where they will take us um so it doesn't bother me and I'm, I'm i doubt the audience would be too disappointed with the yeah. with the thing and the the, things that you are... know to be fair the other two bastards take you into some fucking weird places so i you know yeah. it's fairly yeah. lame really pretty, yeah very very tame uh <laughs> very tame standards that i have yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right dude well it's you know i hope you're well and um I guess we'll chat again at some point. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for reaching out to me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no worries, man. I'll try yeah. and find some more weird things to talk about. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, mate. See ya. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Bye.